<laughs> let's uh, let's get this show started, shall we? I hope these cameras are still running. <laughs> are they? I don't know. Why I don't know why it's not here to tell us. He used to get the show running, so he's got it on, I believe. So yeah. All right. So anyway. hi everybody. This is Talking Dedersons. I'm here with some awesome guests. Thank you guys so much for watching. By the way, I'm Oz. Hi. Uh, today's guests are. <laughs> let me make sure I get this name right because I don't want to. I'm going to start. Derek L. Cook. He plays Papa Dederson. I call him Papa Dederson. Papa Dederson. And we got Jeff Scaduto. Very good. Boom. Right on the night. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> Way to go, man. And you, and you play Mayor Justice. I do. I'm I'm, I, I'm really excited to have you here uh, because it's I was to be here. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I I'm gonna get a lot of heat for this. I'm a fan of Mayor Justice in <sighs> the sense I know I know <sighs> he's the villain of the show in a sense. He's sort of quote unquote the bad guy he's the one that wants to keep these cities separated from one another he's afraid of the living dead but he's got a reason and that's the thing that i think gets washed over a lot that i respect about him i feel like and i've told chris this before excuse me that if i were in this world i think i would be more like mayor justice than anybody Hmm. i think if i lived through the zombie apocalypse and you forgive me if i'm wrong here but the mayor lost his wife during the apocalypse. Is that not correct? That is correct. I think I would become like this militant, angry person, or you know, who was just really concerned with protecting what he has left, with this deep understanding of what the perils of this world entail. And for for that reason, I really, I really understand where he's coming from. And sometimes I, I feel like a little bad that he gets portrayed in such a one sided way. I feel like I get it. Like I, I, I understand that anger and that fear. Could you talk a little bit about how you feel about the character and, and what you think about his motivations and why he does the things he does? Well, I think that uh, Mayor Justice has his motivation. It's definitely deeply rooted because of the loss of his wife, mm. but um, also watching what has gone on around him and the fact that uh, they've had to alter their lives in a way that is completely different than the rest of the world. And I think that he's just fed up. And he's one of these guys that is willing to take things in his own hand, take care of it, and deal with it in his own way. Uh, Being a strong-willed individual, uh, he really loves his family, and that's really the most important thing to him is his family. Mm -hmm. And he wants to protect everybody around him. That's really his motivation, I believe. Wow. Uh, When you came to the character, uh, when you read for him, I'm assuming you read for him. Or did you just get the part? Um, just like, he's that was, good. I think there was a, a number of different things that were brought to the table. And then I, I talked with uh, Wyatt and Chris, and they're like, what do you think about this guy? And then I read uh, a couple of different scripts, and I said, I kind of like his persona. <laughs> he's kind of uh, got an edge to him, and I like that. Did you feel like you were going to be able to portray that character? Because I've met you, I've talked to you, we've been talking for a little while here. I don't see a lot of mayor justice in you as a person. <laughs> You're really acting. <laughs> like, well, uh do you feel like uh, do you feel like you see a lot of mayor justice in yourself? Or I'm definitely an otter. I'm a person who likes to play and have a good time. And I, I think my uh, strong willed side. I like I, the family values. I definitely relate to. Mm-hmm. I'm not so sure. I would say uh, his um, just pounding his fist and being that guy that's going to tell everybody what they're going to do right now. This is what's happening. That's really not me. <laughs> and uh, so that's definitely acting in that part. In that part, but. Without a doubt, I, I like his character, and I think he's uh, he's a person that people definitely are polarized by. Yeah. Do you think um, from the from the get go was this? Because I didn't I didn't actually see the last episode, but I've, I've talked to Wyatt about it. He's given me some idea of what's going on. And Mayor Justice, he's he's going he's he's getting into. Uh, I'm going to use a Walking Dead reference here. He's he's getting into the uh, uh, the governor stage. <laughs> of, of his uh, of his uh, progress as a character on this show, um, do you see this coming? Do you no, think it's no? a surprise to me? Pretty much uh, every shoot has been a surprise to me. So it's been uh, when they hand me a script, this is what we'd like you to do, um, and you you could see the character now um, starting to manifest his wishes, mm. and it's kind of a a neat thing to be able to to do that and see how Chris is bringing this to the table. And I think she's given him kind of a, um, definitely a family-oriented background, but he does have his own agenda. So his agenda is no one's getting in the way of that. No mm. one. And what's his overall agenda? What is he going for? Well, he's going for control and getting back 
making America great again. <laughs> Especially I Riverside. feel like we've starting heard with, that. I've heard that starting before. Starting with Riverside. It's very important that Riverside gets back to where they were. Yeah. What does that even mean? Back to what bef- to what they were before the apocalypse? Exactly. But what does that mean? Well, right now they're in a barter program. There's a lot of things that go on with, with the town itself that makes it uh, a unique entity amongst the other towns in the rest of the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, they don't uh, have cash as currency. They barter and trade for things. So there's the thing that he set up as a mayor that he would not allow these things to be going on in his town because he's not going to be a part of that. Uh, it's not going to happen with the folks that live in his town. We're not associating with the people that are outside of our gates. Not happening. So not even with the other humans? Not even the other survivors? I don't believe that up to this point he's had any interaction with anybody but the people in his own town. So am I, am I, am I being led to believe that... that Mayor Justice is trying to set up like a whole Jonestown, you know, like keep the outside out. <laughs> like we're no Kool Aid up to this point. <laughs> the seen. way you just described it, I feel like we're, we're headed towards a Waco event. It's uh, it's going to definitely uh, pick up. I think the pace seems to be picking up, and his and he is definitely trying to instill some fire and brimstone in the town folk. All right. Well, that's interesting. I, I'm really, it's awesome to hear your perspective on it. I feel like as the actor, you maybe have some more insight. I know that you don't really know what's going to happen next till Chris writes it, but you yes. do sort of control sort of the, the character of the character, right? Of, of how he delivers his lines and, and mm-hmm. sort of what his take on it is. He yeah. started off easy. <laughs> um, he was, uh, at first there were things that were going on and he didn't like him and he put his foot down and, and so on. But as Chris has developed the character, it's, he's become... I think uh, a bit more uh, headstrong. Okay, in his cause. I want to ask you a few more questions real quick. But first, we got Derek here. How's it going, man? It's going good. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming back. Oh, I appreciate well, it. I know it's a drive for you, so I'm always happy to see you here. Oh, I love it. <laughs> um, this is the second time you've been on the show. Your character has also progressed a lot since the last time we saw. Last episode, I'm hearing that he's running for mayor now. He's made his decision. Is that official? Uh, you're talking about Ben. I'm, ta- I'm talking about. Papa Dederson. No. No. Is it not Papa Dederson? Who's running for mayor? Ben's running for mayor. Ben Midnight. Ben Midnight. Oh, you're not running for mayor? <laughs> no. I feel like that's where the story's going. I have a funeral home. When when is when is Mr. Dederson gonna run for mayor? I feel like if if if, if Ben Midnight's running for mayor, he needs a foil. He mm-hmm. needs somebody who's gonna come up and stand up to him. And I feel like Papa Dederson's in the perfect place to do that. He's in the perfect position to be like, okay, I'm well liked. People respect me as a business owner in the community, and he stands up to Mister to Ben Midnight. That seems like an obvious move. You know, I think one of David's strongest points is he is he, he's a backbone. Mm-hmm. You know, um, Donna is the backbone of the family. I mean, there she's she's the strength of that family. But D- David has kind of got a sense of he's he's that stable figure for everybody to be around. Mm-hmm. And one of the interesting dynamics right now is with. Um, uh, Bernie, who is the current mayor, um, Beatrice, his wife is the one who actually runs things. Right. And Bernie's kind of the figurehead, so to speak. And now they're, they're you know, he's still on the tizzy because Ben's announced that he's running for mayor and Beatrice is trying to calm him down. And David's kind of that, you know, hey, we're here to support you. You know, you've got the backing of the Dederson Funeral Home. And, uh, you know, it's funny because uh, the way that the lines are written and the way that, that, you know, as David, the way that I say them, you know, me as the actor, I'm sitting there going, oh, my God, David, wake up. <laughs> ben running for mayor, that's a huge problem. Yeah. But he's kind of that, oh, it'll never happen. And all these people, you know, people in, uh, you know, in Bloody Hills will wake up and nobody will vote, vote for Ben because they'll see he's just a loser anyway. Mm. Yeah, so it's kind of that. You know, our current political system might have something to say about that. Yeah. <laughs> That's so weird. You think Chris is like trying to make a, a direct analogy? Ooh. It seems. <laughs> <laughs> I got to say, I did not think that Donald Trump was going to get this far in the elective cycle. I don't think anybody did. I, I'll agree with you there. I, I thought when he came out making some uh, disparaging statements against women, I yeah. thought that was going to be the nail in the coffin. But, what do you. Mm. What is is this? Okay, here's the, here's the question: Is this a matter of people saying? Because it could be a number of things. We're gonna go off topic a little bit here. I know it's the wrong show, but just bear with me because I want to get your you guys' opinion mm-hmm. about this. Is this a matter of? Ruh-roh. 
<laughs> dum, dum, dum. <laughs> is this a matter of people saying like, yes, he's saying horrible things, but I so don't like the nominees that I, I the other nominees that we get to choose from. Like, if you're a Republican in this cycle, who you choose? You choose. You got Ted Cruz, you got George Bush Senior or Junior or whatever that other guy, Jeb. Jeb. You got Jeb. Jeb's. You had uh, John Kasich, who apparently mm-hmm. bored people to tears. Nobody, I don't even know what his position was. They didn't get him. And by the way, he didn't get a lot of time to talk. Apparently, the news cycle didn't care much about what he had to say. You had people like Ben Carson. I mean, as Sleep a with the wheel. <laughs> as as a Republican, was it just like okay, this is like this is the only person who at least I like I hear what he's saying. It could, it could be that it could be that they don't believe that he really means what he was saying. They just like the fact that he just doesn't give a damn. He's willing to say whatever, and they're thinking like, oh, he doesn't really hate you know Mexicans. He doesn't really hate women. He's just saying that because you know he's talking. He's just talking. You know, people just talk sometimes. Or is it that he is tapping into a segment of society that really agrees with those sentiments? I, I, I don't even think it's so much that. I think there has been so much anger and frustration and just general seething just happening for so long that now he's come along and he's kind of tapped into that. Hmm. And he's kind of giving that appearance of I'm going to be able to, I can say what I want, I can do what I want because... Nobody controls me, and people are getting behind that. Hmm. And do you think it's just like people just like displays of authority, like that sense of I don't give a fuck. I say what I want to say. Yeah, who cares? Uh, yeah, I think so. And I'm I think so the, confident who I am. I just I don't care. And I think he's so anti-establishment in terms of the um, the political per, um, or the um, the current political um, arena. I think that he just he's tapped into something that people just they like to get behind. Hmm. Yeah. Before the show, I suggested that maybe it's just the fact that he's not a politician. Like mm-hmm. that might be the thing that people like about him. Yeah, is he's he's not a politician. Like people just don't like the government. Period. There's there is a general sentiment I feel like in this country of I don't like politicians. I don't like government. I don't like the the media. I don't like anybody who seems to be telling me what to do, or who's a part of that, or who seems to be a part of that system. And this guy is not, and so I like him mm-hmm. just because he is not. I get to. It's almost like a. It's almost like. A virtuous vote in a sense I'm not I'm not trying to tell you to vote for Trump by the way please don't misunderstand what I'm saying but in the sense that he's the guy you can vote for and literally say like it's not like if you say I don't like the government he's the one person running where you're like oh yeah he's not in the government Mm -hmm. I can vote for him and I don't have to feel like I'm voting for one of those people and I'm sure I'm sure there's probably a segment of the population that are that probably agree with that and probably they're the reason that that he's that they're backing him yeah <laughs> but but you know the the funny thing with, when we tie all this back into um, you know with with what's going on in Bloody Hills you know with Ben running for for mayor um, it hasn't been it hasn't been established yet what on what um, on what uh, campaign promises he's running on or you know what kind of what kind of platform he's running on mm-hmm. but we just know and Larry does such a fantastic job as Ben. Um, we know because of Ben's character what kind of person he is, and he's just going to cause trouble. Right. He's just going to cause trouble because he can. <laughs> and that's his character. Yeah. Just I'm just here to fuck things up. Well, if I'm you, here to if wreck you, it. If you look, he is was he wreck a, it, Ralph. He was a business owner. In fact, I worked for him. David worked for him. Right. Um, and got fired, and then that's when I David started the first uh, or David started his funeral home. And then we were in direct competition. You know, David's home and uh, Ben's funeral home were in competition. And finally, we shut Ben's uh, funeral home down. Mm. So instead of just sinking away, you know, crawling away and just start doing something else, now he's running for mayor. So he's David's kind of looking at like, you know, I can't believe he's doing this. He's just trying to vie for attention. And, and you know, how pathetic is that? Mm. But apparently, you know, Ben's going to have some steam in the in the campaign, and he's going to be able to put it forth. Now, if he's uh, what he's running against, if he's running against the whole, hey, we can't trust Riverside, and Riverside's running against the whole, we can't trust Bloody Hills, then there'd be some kind of like tension going on there really you know, it's, soon. It's kind of like nineteen eighty four ish. The book. Yeah. Well, the idea was you have all these world governments, and the way they stay in power is by keeping people afraid of the other. Mm-hmm. You know, I can't even remember the names. Of it. We only get we only really get to understand 
one of them because of the character. Yeah. But the idea is essentially if you drop yourself into any one of those other spots in the world at the time, you'd, you'd essentially be in the same country. Well, it's you know, totalitarianism, it's, right? It's interesting you brought that up too because, uh, you know, everybody in Riverside is listening to Mayor Justice. Mm hmm. He's like the sole voice that's speaking right now. And I think they're, uh, Madam Not Gilda. Not necessarily reason, but yeah. the sole voice. Yeah, yes. Mad, Madam Gilda, I think, has spoken out against you. But mm -hmm. for the most part, um, I think people in Riverside are, are at least behind you or at least willing to listen to what you have to say. And by the same token, now we're starting to listen to maybe what Ben is saying. So, like in 1984, they would take the news and one day it would be this, and the next day they would change that news story to be whatever the government wanted it to be then. Right. And doesn't matter what it was yesterday, today it's this, and this is what you need to believe yeah. in. Rewriting history. Rewriting history. And if you've got both sides doing that, you know, who do you believe? Who do you, you know, what's the truth? Hmm. That's like a cycle of propaganda. <laughs> this is great. Exactly. <laughs> That's horrifying. Exactly. I kind of want to stand by the wall and see what happens. <laughs> how active is David in keeping, uh, not David, how active is the character, Papa Dederson, in keeping, uh, in helping um, Ash and his buddy, who's, I can never remember the name of that character, Cliff, Cliff uh, stay, because I know that they're they're working on making this sort of normal for the citizens. Like, they got these two humans living in there with the, inside of the, inside of uh, uh, Bloody Hills, and it's weird. It's weird for everybody because they're the outsiders and they've been taught to be afraid of these people for a long time and now they're trying to work on a campaign of sort of normalcy. Like, it's okay. They're not going to kill us. They're not all bad people. Um, it, d David's kind of like a... He's, two, he's of two minds on that because the one side, um, his daughter's involved. Right. And that is... I mean, she's near and dear to his heart. So he wants to do everything to protect her. But she knows that, you know, it, it, but he also takes his heart's out also for Ash, too, because he understands the situation. Um, you know, his, his mother's infected. They went looking for her. They found her, by the way, who, incidentally, if you didn't know, is played by my wife, Dawn no. Fries and Cook. Okay. <laughs> and a um, little plug there for her. <laughs> and a little um, plug to keep her on the show. Exactly. Bonus, yeah. time. Bonus points. Wyatt, <laughs> <laughs> this man's wife needs work. So, <laughs> uh, but um, so he he's he wants to help Ash and Cliff, and he wants to be able to you know to take care of his family, and he he, he kind of considers Ash and Cliff to be an extended family. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we're still living in a town that's not open to that kind of thing happening, where we have humans just pop in and and just be able to walk about. So. I, you know, the, the funeral home, I still have to worry about my business. <laughs> right, right. So, and if that, if word gets around that we're harboring humans, you know, what's going to happen? Could, you know, could we lose business? Could so we he's got, Papa Derrickson's got real practical concerns. Yes. You know what that reminds me of? Hmm. It reminds me of that scene from 12 Years a Slave where, um, uh, uh, Cumberbatch, what's his first name? Benedict. Benedict Cumberbatch and, uh, Tuigia. I'm I brought that name too. <laughs> Tuia Tuia Tuigia? LGA4? Tuia LGA4. You know who I'm talking about. The main <laughs> character from that from that movie. He's got him in his house. He's trying to protect him. And he's saying to Benedict Cumberbatch's character, You know I'm not, you know, he's like, you know I'm a free man, right? But you should help me. And and Benedict Cumberbatch's like, look, I got a business to worry about here. If I mm -hmm. set you free, like, I know that's the right thing to do, but I have other concerns that are more paramount. It's so funny how Things like that get in the way of people doing what's morally correct. But mm -hmm. like they come across the morally correct thing to do, and then there's this practical sort of like, but my job, my business, my money, they matter to me as well. And then you start compromising. Mm -hmm. I feel like Mr. Dedison's in that sort of position. I, I think it's at the point now where he can help and he can kind of steer people like – he was the one that kind of said, well, you know, you better go talk to Harriet. You know, she is going to be, you know, the Ashton's new landlord. But at the same time, he's kind of like, oh, God, please don't say much. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need to start a lynch mob, you know. So I think he's, he, so far he's been able to keep that distinction. I think he's been able to help when he can and also, you know, back off when he needs to, you know, to help for, the, you know, for practical purposes. But 
it may come to a point where you know he's going to have to make a decision. Do you feel like a storyline like this is given the serious attention it ought to be given? A lot of times in a sitcom setting, it can be difficult to really shine a, a very serious light on something because it can disrupt the sort of feeling of the show. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Like if you if you have a show that has a lot of upbeat moments and it's more lighthearted, and then it's like we have to deal with a very serious thing here. Something like this is sort of like a an allegory for integration. Um, can it be difficult to display the serious nature of that in a show like this? You know, I think in this, this you may disagree with me on this, but I think that's kind of what we built the show around is mm-hmm. that kind of thing. It, when we first started, I thought, okay, this is going to be like a sitcom I th- or, you know, like a normal, you know, 1950s sitcom, but we have tackled so many like in your face kind of issues. Um, the, the segregation thing, we haven't called it that, but obviously, obviously that's what it is. Um, and, and we've kind of, we've kind of geared it around, Hey, you know, this is how we're dealing with that kind of thing. And I think going forward, I don't see that changing. I think, um, you know, uh, the, the way that Chris writes and, and I, and I believe she's a brilliant writer. Um, she'll be able, you know, she'll bring in those kind of issues and that will kind of mold the show into what it is. Hmm. And by the way, the wall is built already to keep people out. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And they're paying for it because I refuse to allow <laughs> that to be. Apparently the wall doesn't do much good because we've got two of you guys over in our town. Well, they do, they're sneaking over. There. There's still a few ways to get in and out, but we're going to take care the of that. The wall is there. <laughs> yeah. I could get you to pay for it. Yeah. That's, but that's, but that's the, rich. But the more shows we do, the more we kind of get away, I think from, the 50 sitcom in that it's all humorous, all light, heart, you know, everything's wrapped up at the very end. No, this is, we deal with issues as they keep going. So I think it's kind of, it's funny, it's not a soap opera, but it's kind of a sitcom with a soap opera kind of feel to it. Yeah. Do it, you have any idea how the audience feels about that? Like, is that jarring for them? Is that like, hey, this ain't what we signed up for? Or do you feel like they're, they're coming along and they're like, hey, you know, I like where this is headed? I, you know, uh, I have, um, I'm not around the Rockford area much, so a lot of the people that I talk to in the Chicagoland area, some have heard of the show, some don't, and the ones that I talk to about it, I kind of tell them, yeah, it's in the style of the 50 sitcom, you know, but, you know, check it out and see what you think. So I don't get a lot of feedback of what a lot of people watch in the show. Mm-hmm. So, like, um, you know, the thousands of views that we get, I don't, you know, I don't really... I don't really get much comments from from the people watching the show, so I don't really know yeah, what they look, think about that. Hey, if you're listening to this podcast, if you're watching this show and you watch the show, comment. Comment down <laughs> below so we can hear what you think about the show. Please. I'm interested. I'm really yes, interested. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, so yes. there, you, um, your daughter in the show has mm-hmm. been missing for a while. She has. So it's been in the show time, it's been, what, two months? Yes. No one's seen, of her, seen from her. Mm-hmm. Um, and... No one knows what happened to her. Some sightings, but Some they're sightings. not sure. Not positive. Okay. Uh, do you have a working theory that you're going with as the uh, as the as the actor as to what you think has happened? Well, there's so many options here <laughs> that we can go into, and again, it's not. It's hard to say at this. Got point, in the car with the wrong person, Ted Bundy. Where where <laughs> uh, did she disappear on her own? Was she, you know, taken into somebody's uh, somebody else's grasp? Um, was something happening with her father that maybe is increasing? Yeah, we were talking strang- about this before. His stranglehold on the town. I'm a little There's skeptical a lot of, <laughs> about that, that could be theory. I, I, I am too. <laughs> I'm a little skeptical. skeptical about that particular theory. He, there's a whole uh, because of the fact that she's gone. That's a, really he has a housekeeper, and then he's got her. Yeah, um, his wife being gone for quite a while. That's really his heart. And mm-hmm. so uh, I think when he came to the crowd the last time, he wanted people to know, I've got nothing else going for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, this is what's going on. I've got to I've got to make sure the rest of you don't feel this. It's just really, really, really bad. Do you, and, we were talking earlier, you alluded to the idea that while this is a true and, you know, this is real to the character, like he is feeling this loss, that maybe he's also using this to further endeavors that he would have been, uh, trying he things he would have been doing anyway are working towards and he's using his daughter's disappearance as a way to further his ulterior oh, it's a motives. leverage point absolutely yeah. it's a, you could see him uh, he's got a had a steam behind him now and on top of that he's 
He's very focused on the fact that these people are of no value. There is no place for them on the face of the earth. All right. So he wants to eradicate. That. It's not a matter of like, well, we'd like to live peacefully. No, it's has none he, of that. Here, is, is, has anyone besides Ash and Cliff, Cliff, besides Ash and Cliff, been able to talk, and his daughter, been able to talk to him about what's actually going over on over in Bloody Hills? Or is he closing his ears to this, or is he just disconnected from the truth, the reality of the situation? What's no part of talking to them at all? Every so, time they're around, he just looks at them being like, they're a couple knuckleheads, they're going out and getting themselves into trouble, and I'm going to catch them. And one of the first episodes is me just standing and watching them coming back. And I said, it's not going to happen again. And it, just the way it all transpired, just stay away from that side of town or you will not be welcome back in here. Yeah, that's right. He, uh, he threatened to ostracize them. Mm-hmm. And he's carried through with that. Yep. Right? Whew. I wonder what. I'm so I wonder what's gonna happen next. <laughs> I'm curious. Chris, this Chris is like in this dictatorial position. She's the only one that knows what's gonna happen next. Yes, it's horrible. I want. I want. I just want to. Do you watch Game of Thrones? You guys watch Game of oh, Thrones? I I don't. I am definitely an enjoyer of that show. I, it's like one of my favorite shows. I am so. one of those people that I spend a lot of time trying to piece together what's gonna happen next. I find myself doing that with this show. And unfortunately, everything's locked inside of Chris's head. And, I don't, <laughs> and it'd be illegal for me to take a chisel to it. I yeah. can't get in there. You don't know how on. scary it is to talk to Chris and see those gears start turning. Because <laughs> you know things are coming. <laughs> All right. Well, this this has been fascinating. This has been amazing. Thank you guys so much for coming. This is a great conversation. Is there anything you guys want to talk about before we take off? Anything I didn't hit? Boy, there's a, a lot of things. I mean, there's so much coming up. Uh, yeah. yeah. To continue on right now. I mean, the characters that are being developed around uh, watching them. Uh, I really love watching Tony uh, Piper, who portrays mm-hmm. Madame Gilda. Mm-hmm. And um, she is a, uh, the way she's, she's so sensitive and, you know, talks to people and wants to know their feelings and all this. And, and her interacting with me, I think she's just a knucklehead and I'm <laughs> perpetually I'm abusing her. And I really like that character. I think she's really, really good. Um, and a lot of other, I'm watching these young people that are uh, doing their parts and what's going on at the beginning of the show in different port, parts of the show. It's amazing. I mean, they're really developing their, from mm-hmm. young characters. Now they're becoming uh, more emboldened with the way they are, the way they talk to their elders, the way they talk to the people around them. And, and they're not being controlled as much as they were before. So this is really interesting. quite a bit of leeway to expand mm-hmm. which is really neat to watch yeah yep. that's something that we haven't talked about i don't think with anybody that i've interviewed from the show yet that it is for the kids it is sort of a coming of age thing they are finding mm-hmm. their voices mm-hmm. right as yes. individual people definitely yes that's very interesting i hadn't even thought about that that's something i should have brought up a long time ago thank you mm-hmm. and as as for the actors themselves i think they're really growing into their roles mm-hmm. and and i'm amazed um by the talent that we have on the show yeah it, it's it's amazing that um, and they just seem to be more comfortable and as as we go on so. every episode, mm-hmm. watch them grow. All right, uh, the most recent episode was Die and Let Live. Yes, so, yes. was that episode what thirteen? Eleven. Eleven. We're on eleven. <laughs> All right, and that's out now. Go watch it. Next episode is that going to be the musical? Yes, musical episode in the next episode. All right. Going to be a minute before that one comes out. We'll talk about it when it does come out. Thank you guys so much for coming, by the way. Thank Again, you, Thank you for having us. Excellent conversation. was awesome. Thank you guys for watching. That was Talking Dedersons. I'm Oz, and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.